Hello everyone and welcome to Real Talk Office Hours Hunting for Silver Linings for this Wednesday, August 19, 2020. Hosted today by yours truly, Corey Hart. We have George Gutzanos, and we have a very special guest. We've got uh, Becky joining us here. She's a professor, associate professor, and chair of economics at Calvin University right here in West Michigan in the Great Lakes region of the United States. We're brought to you by Startup Grind, the world's largest startup community. We have 600 plus chapters in over 125 countries, and we operate with a mission to educate, inspire, and connect. This pandemic has been and will continue to be the great global leveler. And as entrepreneurs, we need to do our very best for our teams, families, and businesses. And to do so, we need to be informed, rational, analytical, and rigorous in our thinking. We should also learn to control our biases as they emerge in various circumstances. Well, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as we track the intersection of facts, biases, and action through our review of global financial markets, alongside check-ins with Real Talk and startup, uh, with Startup Grind chapter directors, entrepreneurs, and ecosystem stakeholders from across the world. We can also offer you to check the uh, recordings at startupgrind.com slash grand rapids. And we do this because no one has a crystal ball, but if we keep our eyes and ears open and pay attention, we may be able to see around the bend and with some luck spot the silver linings that are on every cloud. Now, before George gets into his financial update, a quick little bit of housekeeping. Comments made and views expressed by all participants in this podcast are not intended to invite or incite individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors to buy or sell financial assets, real assets, commodities, futures, and or options. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform, not to trade or to invest. If you feel compelled to trade and or invest, and remember, however, risk is everywhere, even when you think that you're not taking a risk. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce George to get us started with what the global markets are thinking. George, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, Kerry. Uh, I would like to congratulate um, Professor Haney for completing the summer courses at Calvin University. I heard through the grapevine that the students were delighted and the econometrics <laughs> class was outstanding. Well, thank you, George. I greatly enjoyed teaching this summer uh, and the students enjoyed the format of it being asynchronous so that they could watch their videos while they're at the beach or whatever. So made econometrics a little bit more fun. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, against this background, I have in front of me the uh, webpage of Calvin University. I would like to start by mentioning that Professor Haney is the chair of the economics department and uh, a professor of economics and business in um, Calvin University. Um, I would like in that sense to modify a little bit uh, today's presentation of the asset classes by reminding our investors and our entrepreneurs that the reason we start the real talk with a review of the financial markets is because we believe that um, the markets give us signals that are distinct to those of the publicly available journals. In other words, um, the asset classes that we typically cover are a bonds, currencies, commodities, including energies, grains, and precious metals with industrial metals involved as well. And then towards the end, we look at um, equities. We um, started doing this back in uh, late March, early February, every uh, April with Corey because it was clear that Ray Dalio was 100% correct. If you look at the crisis since 1980, every successful crisis led to lower interest rates, to initial monetary stimuli on one side of the balance sheet, essentially liabilities. The difference this time around is that the Federal Reserve has intervened both on the liabilities and on the assets on an economy-wide basis. In other words, whereas in previous crises, we used to see federal government intervention limited to the banking sector. This time around, the magnitude of the crisis of the microeconomic shock is of such magnitude that the Federal Reserve had to intervene on both sides of the balance sheet. In other words, to buy assets, to keep them at relatively respective prices, and B, to provide liquidity on the liability side so that we don't have a collapse of not only the banking system, but also the corporate sector, which of course raises a host of questions, some of which I would like to discuss later on today with Professor Haney, including moral hazard, including how do you enter, how do you exit? And more important than that, 
how do you manage the process between entry and exit? Let's start by looking at um, our first um, asset class, currencies. I have always uh, mentioned uh, that um, from my early days in investment banking, I always understood that the major currency crosses, as we call them, tell us investor preferences. They are the most sensitive part of, so to speak, the plexus of um, uh, currency, of sorry, of assets. In other words, the first area to look at, if you're looking at the effects of monetary and or fiscal policy, is um, the major crosses, particularly euro dollar, euro yen, sterling uh, dollar or cable in other words, Aussie dollar and uh, Canadian dollar. Of course, the Swiss franc is very important as well. What we have seen here is um, since the middle of the crisis uh, on March 23rd, 2020, when the dollar hit uh, 106 against the euro, we have uh, seen a rapid depreciation of the dollar against the euro by about 13%, 14%, and against the basket of currencies by over 12%. What that suggests is that the investor community has been, on the one hand, less concerned about the, so to speak, next few months. In other words, the previous safe haven considerations regarding dollar have been eliminated. eliminated. So investors hungry for yield have abandoned the US dollar denominator world and they're heading into emerging markets, Europe and alternative currencies. Whether this is a wise idea or not is predicated on the dollar shortage in the global economy. In other words, as a reserve currency, dollar has a special role in the global economic system. And we have noticed that in every single crisis from the 80s onwards, whether it was the tequila crisis in Mexico, the Asian crisis in uh, Southeast Asia, or our 2008-2009 homemade crisis here, the first result was dollar shortage. And uh, this uh, shortage has been reversed to some extent relatively successfully and orderly, although the process has been very quick. The bond market is telling us, however, a completely different story. You may recall from previous observations that we always look at the 10-year because the 10-year bond market is probably the most liquid uh, in, um, around the world. And what we've seen is that um, in the uh, Far East Asian, the Southeast Asian uh, world, the bond market is stable. In other words, we have not had a run on the bond market. The same is reflected in European bonds and the same is reflected in our North American bonds. Why? Because as um, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, has indicated, inflation is not our concern, not at the moment. Irrespective of how much money we've printed at the moment, the number one issue is deflation, not inflation. The bond market has behaved relatively normally, although the prices of the 10-year bonds indicate that fixed income investors are still concerned and they still prefer government debt instruments to the private sector for the time being. Again, having said that, we've seen that every Tom, Dick and Harry who could afford because of a credit rating, irrespective of whether this credit rating was junk or investment grade, they have been borrowing significantly over the last three months. Last week, we noted the second tapping of the bond market by Apple, $5.5 billion. Uh, again, these are big numbers and we will discuss this issue of the bond market later on. In Europe, we are still enjoying the lull of um, the successful summit three weeks ago. Um, who would have ever thought that Greece would be having a 10-year bond around 1%, Italy under 1%, and Spain at 0.3%. European investors hungry for yield obviously have bought every single asset in the uh, bond world that provided yield. Here in the US, we have moved backwards and forwards from 0.38 in the middle of the crisis to about just under 1% a couple of weeks ago. We're now in the middle of uh, uh, the spectrum again, 0.65%. Again, the major issue is where do we go from here? The bond investors are concerned, quite rightly so. We have seen that we have significant unemployment at 10.2%. Uh, 
um, we also have people who have exited the market. And at the same time, we have sectors of the economy like the entertainment industry, the hospitality industry, that are severely crippled. As we noted in uh, previous uh, Real Talk uh, events, these uh, sectors of the economy were very important because they provided jobs to newcomers with very little skill where they would learn the beginning of saving, work, participation in the labor force. The sector was also important because you had pensioners who were looking for additional income. You had people with no skills at various stages of their lives who could not afford to go and work somewhere else. And the hospitality industry was a good entry point. With this sector severely damaged, where are these people going to go? So um, the bond market remains skeptical, remains very cautious. And um, we see that commodities, on the other hand, have enjoyed a wonderful, wonderful rally based on a couple of things. First of all, look at uh, copper. Copper is over $300. I have always indicated to you that copper is a surrogate for manufacturing growth. Gro copper is a metal that we use in manufacturing. And from the lows of $190 in the middle of the crisis, we're now over $300. Thanks to Chinese manufacturing, thanks to pickup in manufacturing activity around the world, we are beginning to see that uh, the industrial metals have performed well, and not least because of the declining dollar value. West Texas Intermediate, over $42. Brent, over, you traded over 45 a little while ago. Now uh, 44.90. Natural gas, 240. Big numbers. Why? Well, obviously, we have issues with California. We have heat in the West. And um, the electricity generation is an overdrive here in North America. Gold, 1990. Uh, it was over 2000 uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. Clearly, there is um, a bidding process on gold. We see technical trading here, but for the most part, the price of gold is driven by concern about the global uh, supply of money, the debasement of the currencies, and safe haven considerations. We do not expect that this is going to subside very soon. On the other hand, silver, my goodness, it seems that everybody has been short silver, and suddenly everybody loves silver. Uh, we have no view, uh, as um, I have always said, we're trying to decipher messages from the markets. We do not take views. That is not the purpose of uh, this event. If you feel compelled to trade, please talk to a psychologist or your broker, or both. On agriculture, um, I always recommend that um, you look at the grains with a political eye. Uh, in other words, our farmers here in North America have done their best over the last 10 years. Crop after crop after crop, the grains have done exceptionally well. This year is not an outlier. A healthy rain season, a healthy sun with no major uh, temperature issues or humidity issues have led to an outstanding, truly outstanding crop. Therefore, with no demand from Southeast Asia and um, the dragon, the Chinese dragon, we are going to see prices under pressure. And uh, I would recommend that um, we do not have any concerns at this stage about our food supply chain. There is ample food around for the time being. What is important, however, is to recognize that our farmers are going to be under pressure. Looking at the um, equities market, uh, summarizing our um, uh, financial markets overview, we see that the picture is mixed. Southeast Asia was uh, negative. Um, Hong Kong was negative. Um, the um, Indian market has done well. Uh, Karachi was marginally, marginally down. Europe, on the other hand, is um, a little bit higher this morning. And the reason is clearly um, a little bit of a positive sentiment after the sell-off yesterday. I think um, the um, European markets are taking cue from the US and we see that the US market is heading higher thanks to the liquidity provided by the Federal Reserve. As we mentioned, equity investors, fund investors have two alternatives, TINA and FOMO. There is no alternative except to buy and FOMO fear of missing out. As uh, we have heard from um, Howard Marks of Oak Tree, this is a very peculiar market, very peculiar market indeed. Last week, we heard time and again 
from a number of the members of the Federal Reserve that they're suggesting fiscal positioning. In other words, the Federal Reserve can deliver up to a certain point, but it cannot deliver everything. And all the members of the board, um, well, at least many of them that have spoken publicly about it, have indicated that they would encourage a fiscal decision making soon. In the meantime, as you can see, the markets are waiting patiently. They have not sold off. And uh, more important than that, what we have seen is that the markets are waiting for the Federal Reserve. Uh, later on today, we have the minutes published and we will see what it says. Against this background, I would like to go back to our uh, guest for the day and um, invite uh, Professor Haney to tell us a bit uh, about her background and how she managed to get to Calvin. So thank you, George. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be part of this startup grind and the uh, interesting community of entrepreneurs that are both here in Grand Rapids and around the world. Uh, I once was an entrepreneur many years ago. Um, I have a little bit of a windy path before coming to Calvin. I uh, graduated um, with a computer information systems degree as an undergrad and I did computer consulting for Accenture for a few years and really enjoyed uh, the beginning of the computer technology age, that's where I was uh, back in the early 80s. Um, and then uh, was really called uh, curious about how to use all of these technical and, and managerial skills in a way that would serve a maybe a little bit more of a greater purpose, although I, you know, there's nothing wrong with corporations that are serving a great purpose as well. But I just felt a different calling. So that's why I went back and got my PhD in uh, economics at University of Chicago. I thought that that's the place where uh, you, the sharpest tools can be used to solve the, the trickiest, uh, thorniest, naughtiest problems. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Um, do you have by any chance uh, any courses with the great thinker in Chicago? Uh, I happened to be there at that, that early 80s heyday with um, Bob Lucas, my advisor, Jim Heckman, um, Gary Becker. They're all great thinkers. and uh, Rational classes, expectations and so on. Yes. And so oh, my gosh. I was there right in the class uh, where that was going on. It was an incredible, it was a heady experience. It's interesting to look back now. Uh, with a different, a little bit different perspective, a little bit more knowledge. Um, there, I was sort of just taken in, hook, line, and sinker. Um, Can not imagine a different way. When we were in the classroom, you know, we'd make assumptions. Well, you know, take the taxes. Okay, just throw that in the ocean, and then you know, we'll see what happens with the rest of the economy. And I would very much uh, disagree that that's a, a helpful assumption. I think that there's a lot of private government or public entrepreneurship opportunities that are particularly uh, exploding now. And so I think that kind of ignoring the public sector um, it, too much uh, can really, or simplifying the assumptions about the public sector can really cause, um, I don't know, some missed opportunities and some, I'd say, inefficient activity. So I'm looking forward to seeing this kind of entrepreneurial partnership kind of break loose uh, in this pandemic driven time where everybody's been sort of sent to their room. <laughs> everybody's, you know, back home and we've got to kind of build it back up from ground zero. Can you speak a little bit more about this, Professor Hayden? So I, um, I think that since Reagan, since the early 80s, it's been a real common refrain to say um, the government is, is the problem, not the solution, or the government is, don't wait for the government to solve things. And I agree with that. I think that uh, we, you know, the innovation that is quite a, a driver of our economy um, would be stunted if there was too much governmental uh, kind of oversight or control. But that being said, uh, there's an incredible leverage or scaffolding that the public sector provides that we almost take for granted. And if we take it too much for granted and don't uh, feed it, don't give it the, the, uh, the resources that it needs for like the leverage that the Fed is, is providing is an example of how the public sector 
can help um, keep the economy and innovation rolling, even in times of great economic decline like this. Um, but to, to also uh, imagine how the, the work of the, the risk kind of sharing work that the public sector can provide, how vital that is to innovation, uh, that you, you can't have a, a greater risk share than, than the govern, government to spread risk across so many um, populations. And that's, that's how you can face this kind of uncertainty without feeling so much of the um, the tail being uh, the, the economy being wagged by the tail of all of the being the up and down. Uh, you can spread that risk, you can mitigate that risk, and you can set the table for with with resources and research and um, kind of the uh, big mission focused ideas, you can set the table. Uh, the public sector can set that table. And then as we turn the corner from sort of this economic tumult, um, there will be a fertile ground for innovation and entrepreneurship without having uh, to bear so much of the risk individually or at the, um, at, the, at the tiny small business, small entrepreneurial level, entrepreneur level. level. That's one of the roles that I see. Uh, I think we are in a very, we are entering a more risky uncertain time, not just risk, but a, a lot of uncertainty. We don't even know what we don't know. Um, it's not that there's, uh, you know, some uh, well uh, laid out various paths that the economy might go or that society might go. There's just a lot of things we don't understand that might happen. Uh, and hopefully uh, what we're doing now is investing in those resources like basic education, um, very uh, well-funded, or at least maybe not universal healthcare, but a healthcare system that somehow gives people the freedom to leave their job and start to be an entrepreneur, or to um, at least take that kind of risk and financial concern off the table. And who, the you know the healthcare is sort of one of my um, uh, soapbox issues uh, when you look at the U.S. compared to all of the other industrialized nations. Uh, that our our a, com, almost uh, worship of everything should be individual or free market. Um, I think there's a, that's a good instinct to have, but it needs to be balanced uh, with. The idea that uh, this free market is great for innovation, but it's terrible when there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of um, asynchronous information or asymptotic knowledge, you know, like there is with health, asymptotic. As, um, uh, people are uh, worried about where their health insurance is going to come from. There's just a lot of noise and uncertainty that's added into our economy that isn't really present in a lot of other developed nations. Although I'd like to hear perspectives but, uh, from others. But one of the things that I'm seeing in the pandemic is that we've all had an opportunity to kind of step back. And instead of in our constant churning to go to work, come home, do our families, go back to work, that churn we've uh, is taken away a little bit and we can see the situation that the economy is in in terms of the the type of uh, basic needs or scaffolding that is there or not for the innovation to take off uh, it doesn't... you're raising a whole range of issues I know <laughs> there's so um, much um... going on well, it, it is fascinating because the moment you start talking about the infrastructure, you remind me of Mary O'Mara's book about the code, where she very about brutally, the, say that again? The code, the oh, code, yeah. mm -hmm. where she goes back all the way to a fair child communications and um, the, um, 
racer to the moon um, with Sputnik and, and so on and so forth, yeah. and yeah. how effectively the public-private partnership um, worked. Yes, the yes. Eisenhower administration and the highways, it worked. Yes. Um, again, there's an element of infrastructure building that is incomplete and or antiquated. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think in this regard, in, telecommunications have now come to the next level. And I think what Elon Musk is doing with his satellites is extraordinary. Yes. Uh, extraordinary. And I wish him good luck because that means once we have the system in place, then um, artificial intelligence will be better in our cars, in our communications, and we will only need the gadgets to connect, yes. which will be the next level in terms of education, information sharing, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also yeah. think that this, this crisis here is very, very clearly highlighting our institutional limitations. We're still, in, in a way, we're, our institutions are 19th century institutions, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, and I think I, if people would look at healthcare as part of an infrastructure rather than a commodity, um, I think that that might be a, a, a framing that might help us rethink how as we go forward and get out of the pandemic we create a a, a better more um, fertile ground for innovation because i know so many people you 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 you're scared to go out on your own uh you're scared to be uh, to innovate you're scared to to move to find a better job because everything about your your health is wrapped up in our employment and because of that uh, that tie is created an incredible wedge, I think, in our efficiency, our ability for people to be uh, geographically mobile, to be innovatively mobile, to change uh, jobs or change uh, focuses to as people's gifts and uh, passions sort of, you know, get they know more and more as they kind of move along in their career. They should be free to to reallocate their uh, their time and talents. And it's interesting that again possibility. that you, I'm sorry to interrupt for a second, but it's, it's interesting that you're pointing out the fact that we should perhaps start looking at healthcare as an infrastructure, not a, yeah. uh, a good or a service or a commodity that has a price, uh, which of course begs the question, should we also start thinking about a universal basic income at some point? Well, yes. In fact, I have I taught labor economics in the spring, and the final uh, exam or the final project was a debate amongst the students about universal basic income. And a lot of so they they read uh, a wide variety of thinkers on this, and interestingly. One of the founding uh, arguments for universal basic income was found in Hayek, um, Friedrich Hayek, who's very much, uh, you know, the Austrian version or uh, paradigm is very much as, as um, local as you can get. Knowledge is, is the information and that the most best knowledge is going to come at the local level. So you don't want to have a lot of um, interference from government bureaucrats and all of that. You want everything to kind of emerge from the bottom up. You want to be free from government intervention or people that don't know as much as you do on the ground. But one of the things that I, he wouldn't have said universal basic income, maybe in this exact time or terms, but one of the freedoms that he would argue for, argued for is the, is the freedom to have to, to um, have to work in a way that is not as efficient as it could be. So in other words, work at a, just what I was saying, work at a job because you can't leave it to start on your own um, or to st go to move to another place because you're tied to it. Um, because either you need the income and you can't bear the risk to make a change. Um, if you have universal basic income as that uh, scaffolding, 
some would say you could be a safety net that turns into a hammock. That's, you know, that's always the problem. I just don't see, from my worldview, I just, I see more people wanting to give and contribute and that rather than lay around in a hammock, that that universal basic income would allow, again, more freedom for people to most efficiently allocate their resources, to put it in economic terms. Yes, Hayek was very clear in his thinking, uh, and in a sense, following the Ossian school with Schumpeter, mm -hmm. uh, that um, if, if capitalism is to work, in other words, if we have um, uninhibited, um, um, unencumbered the ability to pursue self-interest, then we will reach optimal solutions. But if you don't have a health infrastructure, if you don't have education, and I would argue also the um, social security net Right. Of course, these are expensive, but if you don't have these, how are you going to essentially move forward? You, um, yeah, you've got a sticky wicket instead of this. Absolutely. Free, yeah, instead of a free moving engine of people. And it's interesting here that from our directors, um, from our discussions over the last uh, several weeks, many of the directors do not see this as, in other words, they do not see healthcare, they do not see. Um, the institutional uh, aspect of it, the infrastructure aspect, they take it for granted that they don't have it. We uh, look at our no. interlocutors in Latin America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and they say, okay, we're bootstrapping here. And we will actually make it because we have to make it. We have no alternatives. And I'm wondering whether to some extent this is because they are younger populations, for instance, in the Philippines, um, mm. Africa, or is it because they are starting from a point where our thinking has not um, advanced that much in the sense that I remember education is, is both formal and informal and yeah care used to be provided by the family right yeah. yeah once you start breaking down the family nucleus then you need social infrastructure Mm -hmm. And in many of these societies, there's still the, the family nucleus is still there, albeit not particularly um, well endowed, with limitations, economic, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering to what extent we are going to learn and, and try to integrate um, the health infrastructure argument. Yeah. yeah, I'm really curious about other people's opinions of looking. I mean, maybe I just look at, you know, pastors are green on the other side of the fence, but it does seem to um, foment or encourage risk taking and innovation when you don't have to worry about the healthcare. And it Absolutely. seems like that's, yeah. that's the norm almost every place else. And I'm wondering if um, many of our um, colleagues and uh, directors and the communities throughout Africa, throughout Latin America and Asia, if they did have a safety net, how fast would they be running towards progress? Evolution, um, yeah. achieving better outcomes and so on and so forth, because certainly outcomes are dependent on the support infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. We have a question. Should yeah, we? Go ahead. I like this question uh, from one of our participants, from Kate Avery. Um, she asks, is it risk taking if there is no risk? And I'm wondering, does that question mean if we provide that social safety net, like a healthcare infrastructure or universal basic income, is the question that you're asking that, well, then that takes away all the risk. So then people won't even do innovate. They won't have to. Is that maybe what that question is about? Because I would, I would argue, if that's what it is, I would argue that the risk taking that we want people to take is not with their lives or with their health, or with, with their health or with their income, but with an idea, so that they really try something, they try to invent something, or they try to provide a service, or they try to start a, a, a kiosk that sells something, um, and try to make a go of it, knowing that they're following their passion. But if it doesn't work and their passion doesn't sort of meet the needs or desires of the people that would be their customers, uh, they are free to have tried it, failed, and try something else again without having completely bankrupted themselves or their families or uh, given them um, a, uh, such a dent in their 
trajectory that they shouldn't have even tried it to begin with. So that to me is creating a, um, it's like putting up a, a, a fence around a, a playground. You want people to be able to go play, but safely, right? You want them to experiment. You want kids to go experiment, but not to the point where they could get killed or lost or maimed. So that's what I would say as scaffolding or um, the health and universal basic income as, as infrastructure for like fences around a playground. Which, uh, talking about fences in the playground, can we talk a little bit about monetary policy? <laughs> we can try. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you are the driver. Please guide us. But before you do this, I have a request. May I please have a copy of the syllabus about uh, the um, debate concerning um, universal basic income? I would love to read uh, the thing. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And in fact, with the permission of some of the students, I can provide their videotaped presentations. Um, they led presentations with, uh, they, they came up with discussion questions and reflection questions. It was just a rich and robust class participation around this. And it was interesting to see that students that came in um, quite opposed, left the debate, still probably not gung-ho or championing it, but much more thoughtful, introspective, or questioning about it. Um, and those that came in thinking uh, universal basic income, why haven't we gone there already, um, were much more um, concerned about how to balance it and, and asked good questions. You know, if we take away the provision of um, the 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 income tested and the specific needs like food stamps or housing and vouchers and all that, those, those are very um, targeted. And if we took all of that infrastructure out and then just had basic needs met with a universal basic income, would that, who might that um, harm or who might that privilege or would that even financially work out? And so of course they, they uh, studied Andrew Yang's proposal for this universal basic income. And, you know, you can see it work, but you could also ask some pretty hard questions of some of the assumptions. Um, and I think that uh, the pandemic and this kind of gigantic global shakeup, I hope, provides an opportunity for us to just try some experiments. What works? Sure. I mean, uh, again, you have probably highlighted the at the core of the debate is uh, a moral hazard issue. Right, right. And we see it time and again across efforts, across sectors, we're coming to the point where we need to have decision makers based on facts, not from political views, and to be open to dialogue and to compromise. Exactly, exactly. And I think we're hopefully, we in the West, um, who have uh, been industrialized the fastest, uh, progressed, developmentally um, in terms of you know universal education and stuff maybe the fastest we've sort of taken our western worldview and said okay this must be the way it works and for you developing country whatever your culture whatever your your current institutions are you really should do it our way you should you know the washington consensus um, i think we've seen enough case studies of how that where that worked and where it also led to trauma um, and and not and, and some unexpected outcomes in terms of severe inequality, severe dependence on um, exports rather than investing in one developing country's own infrastructure. Um, I I hope that we are now humble enough to kind of learn, step back and learn what are some maybe additional ways of uh, infrastructure or political and policy. Uh, combinations that might work. I study indigenous cultures, um, both personally <laughs> and professionally. Um, and, you know, there's, there's places where you could go and see the, the absolute contrast between like a, a tribal um, business and the way it's being run, like the Menominee um, nation in upper or north, northeastern, northwestern Wisconsin, um, 
they were given a plot of land back in 1850 and the settlers, the white folks were given a plot of land right next door to it, a timber to, to, to manage. They were given that little postage stamp and everybody else was given the rest of it. And you can see from 1850 until now, a hundred, almost 200 years later, their little green postage stamp of their forest has been sustainably managed in timber and they've had a wealthy, very sustainable and high quality of living community for the last 150 years where the land around them was, um, it was not sustainably harvested. It was cut down and it is now not only treeless, but it is infertile ground, ground. And so it was, we kind of, the Western mentality was come in, if you can make a profit and make it now, make it now. And then if you make excess profits, invest it in something else. Don't leave stuff in the ground. Don't leave um, an opportunity for a profit uh, around too long. And in fact, as those boom times were happening in the early 1900s, the settlers around there were clamoring for the Menominee tribal reservation land and timber because they, look, they thought they were lazy because they weren't harvesting at all. They said, well, if you're not gonna harvest it, we'll take it. Well, what happened is the more sustainable kind of a communal, more longer term thinking um, rather than uh, with, with a little bit more of a harmony and a balance approach, both politically, relationally, um, that's, a counter, that's a counter way of thinking than kind of this Western a Western mindset, or maybe the Western mindset taken to the extreme. I mean, there's probably a balanced way to do that. I don't want to paint it completely black and white, but that you can look on a satellite image and you can see the stark difference between two political economies. You can see a Which green. Of course, um, yeah. You're now bringing up a, a whole range of topics ranging from um, paying um, uh, inmates for light crimes, not to repeat them. You remember the experiment in California that is being yeah. replicated throughout uh, various cities in the US with tremendous success to, of course, um, the uh, active management of fire, which uh, the indigenous Indians are now asked to do in California right, because right. we have forgotten how to manage fire yeah, um, yeah. in preventive ways. Right. And all the way, of course, to the idea at the higher level that wealth is not money. Family, oh, faith, right. health, education, right. philanthropy, social group, I mean, everything yeah. is, is together. Um, and uh, we, we've talked about it, but um, I think um, it, it, it is very, very uh, interesting that we, we have to address these issues and the crisis accelerate in many of these um, debates. Um, let's, see, let's see how things move on. But um, um, what is your view on the Federal Reserve so far? What grade would you give uh, the Federal Reserve? <sighs> you know, they're in between a rock and a hard place. Um, it, I think that, that is an understatement. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and I think we as an economy are between a rock and a hard place. Um, you know, in 2008, when they started the quantitative easing and the, I think it was the Minnesota, uh, fed president, um, quit over this injection of so much, um, money into the system with this fear of inflation uh, saying this is, you know, this is going to cause more harm than good. And I think what, you know, being able to look back over 10 years to see whether that worked as we expected or not um, is helpful, gives us some helpful information. We can't, of course, look at the counterfactual. We can't see what would have happened if they hadn't done. I think we would have experienced an incredible period of, of trauma. Uh, but would that have we would we have come out on the other end of that better and stronger with stronger, less propped up banking and financial institutions? I don't know. Well, there's an argument, of course, uh, of the Austrian school that would say let uh, all these uh, debt uh, piles get burned so we have creative mm -hmm. destruction. Yeah. But I guess so. We couldn't afford to have 30% unemployment over a three-year period, right? We didn't think we could, but we're experiencing it anyway. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're getting to experience that for another reason anyway. And so uh, maybe we could think a little bit more creatively, think outside the box, maybe change our assumptions. 
I mm -hmm. think uh, providing uh, capital to companies directly has the right tone of intervention. But again, how do we get out of this? Yeah, right. How do we unwind? Once we've, once this is, once we've let that out of the box, how do we unwind from that? Um, our, I would like to look at some other natural experiments where the, where the central bank has played more of a central role in liquidity in economies. Um, rather than it being very much of an, you know, funneled through the intermediary of the commercial banking system. I don't, I'd be curious. I think there, uh, maybe you would know some more uh, case studies of that, where the, we see a variety of different ways that the central bank has performed its role. And there is no, it, it's a cookie cutter. Every central bank is following the Federal Reserve. They well, think, uh, with yeah. the exception of um, King, you remember the former governor of the Bank of England, who was, when he wrote his book about the crisis, he was adamant about the fact that there were mistakes. And there were mistakes uh, done by the uh, central banks, there were mistakes that were done by the lenders, the insurance companies, mm -hmm. the underwriters, mm -hmm. the investment banks, and so on. I mean, the whole, so to speak, decision making process was handicapped. And of yeah. course, then you have. Um, um, the eminent professors here in the U.S. who say um, the system is made to have a crisis. Yeah. The nature of our financial system is to have regular crisis. Right, right. So why don't we act on that? I mean, if that's, it's obviously true. I mean, at least, you know, the fact that the Federal Reserve models couldn't predict the depth of the Great Recession in 2009 that they couldn't, even with the data that they had as we were in it, the models were not robust enough or did not have enough, broad enough assumptions of the, or allowed enough systemic risk possibility to even imagine going to the depths of the recession that we went to. Um, that's telling. I mean, that's no, uh, we were act, operating on the best information that we had. Well, the best information and the best models that we had weren't up to par so they need to be adjusted and if you think that the public sector had issues imagine if you remember what david vineyard the head of risk management for goldman sachs he used to say back in september of 2008 he said every day we're experiencing 20 standard deviation events <laughs> right 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 and uh that calls for a different approach and luckily uh, the center of the the DSGE, the, di the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, those are the, the workhorse models that the Federal Reserve uses. Those are, of course, right there out of University of Chicago. Um, even there, I, I follow very closely um, to see the little, little uh, dashes and dots of light of people trying something a little different and seeing uh, how those models could be um, how the assumptions could be changed, which would result in maybe slightly different models. And some do of the- Do you see any that, change? I do, yeah. Um, I, I follow the um, INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I follow them closely. Uh, my advisor is on their board, so that gives me um, hope. And uh, the person in charge, or one of the fellows that's in Cambridge, um, um, Vasco Carvalho, who's a University of Chicago, uh, alum, PhD, uh, whose advisor was uh, one of my colleagues while I was there. Um, his work, I think, is looking at how these 20 standard deviation events, how they are much more likely if you look at the economy as um, kind of an interdependent network rather than a set of um, static formulas. And this, this way of seeing the economy at, in a network or a more of a, a system where there's a lot of fee where feedback loops can happen. Um, that's, that's what my research is in. And I think that that's going to begin to get some traction. And now that we have the computing power in order to handle those kinds of models, they don't have to be mathematically solvable, which is what they, which was the constraint before. Um, these can be computable. Um, in a slightly different way than the computable general equilibrium. Anyway, I think that that work is what I've got my eye on. Vasco Calvajo and, and, and his compatriots uh, are, and especially all of the work that's going on with the Young Scholars um, Institute at INET, uh, I think that's, that's a place to look and watch 
and, and see what it's, how it's growing. Because I think there's, there's a lot of really good uh, new innovative thinking going on there. Which of course beg begs the question that if we have gradually new thinkers, new dynamism in the dismal science, what do you see in uh, the entrepreneurial community? What do you see as the driving, so to speak, um, I don't know, maybe milestones, may cat maybe catalysts? Um, what do you sense out of this crisis? I think we can more clearly see what we need to have as infrastructure or scaffolding or institutions to have a healthy economy to go forward. I think that our reliance on anybody who wants to work can work and they'll all be able, our, our assumption that, you know, anybody can have a good life no matter, you know, what their starting circumstances were. That assumption is not quite true. Uh, you can work as hard as you can, work two full-time jobs and still have not, have not have enough for healthcare, housing, food, childcare, you know, et cetera. Uh, we don't have a, a platform for which all can flourish. And if you don't have everybody flourishing, you don't have everybody innovating. If you don't have everybody innovating, you don't have everybody contributing. Uh, that's just, that's, uh, we're just leaving resources on the table. And we're perpetuating through a Gini coefficient type of analysis, exactly. a, a, a growing um, a polarity, grow, growing yeah. inequality and so on, yeah. and lack of opportunity ultimately. Right, right. And I think that, you know, the economic assumption that inequality doesn't matter, that we really are, we're kind of neutral, agnostic, uh, really, we just want to be the most efficient that we can possibly be. Well, inequality is, or e more equal opportunities um, and more uh, kind of, of a social, uh, a richer social safety, a more robust, there we go, robust social safety net uh, is critical to an efficient economy. This is actually the key that Corey and I have discovered, luckily through our discussions, that all directors uh, that we've spoken with so far and participants uh, from these discussions indicate to us that communication at this level, at the ground level, is becoming extremely important and relevant. Yes. And the second point is education, skill sharing, knowledge sharing. And this is where the startup grind, I think, is, is a, so to speak, a next paradigm. Yes. Whereby we are sharing ideas and knowledge uh, free of charge. And I'm wondering in this regard, where, where do you see higher education and in general education? Well, that's a big question <laughs> at the end of the hour. Um, well, you can have um, as much time as you want. <laughs> um, I think that that as well is getting a, it's getting a, um, a reset in a, in a way that my hope will lead to much more equal access and um, more uh, right now, I think students come and their parents, you know, they come to school and they are so focused on making sure that their degree will lead them to a high earning job. I mean, they're just so, that's just, that's it. Um, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that per se, except that if that's your sole focus, then we're losing out on, on educating citizens with a broader background in, you know, kind of understanding history, understanding the connections between sociology and business and um, psychology. The techie and the fuzzy. The techie and the fuzzy. You remember? That's right, right. Yep. We have, if we stay so in our silos, um, the way education is sort of set up right now, uh, we are really not preparing the next generation to handle the, the problems that they're, that they're facing um, or to thrive in the in the environment that's upon us. So um, if you allow Thank me you. To, to make this generalization, what you're suggesting is that we have to take the cue from the Israeli startups, right? They're not yes. only engineers or software developers, they have psychologists, they have biologists, they have everything and everyone because everybody has something to contribute. Absolutely. And we don't have, so I do interdisciplinary work with an engineer 
And it took us, we've been working together on different books or, or research papers or whatever over time, maybe seven years or so. For the first two or three years, we were just talking at cross purposes because we've used the same words for different meanings or we had different assumptions. And just that interdisciplinary work uh, was made it clear that it takes a lot of work to, and a lot of humility and a lot of kind of listening well to be able to work in multidisciplinary teams and to work with people with different backgrounds or different expertise or even different cultures. And uh, we don't currently train people to do that well, I don't think. I don't think that's part of the a natural tendency for education to, to teach that kind of, uh, kind of soft skill. And uh, I think that that's what's emerging from these kinds of conversations, these, these nice Zoom calls where any fuzzies and techies can get on the line together and they have to learn to be able to speak to each other and see the value in each other's uh, questions and things that they bring, alternative perspectives. Um, so um, in our little patch of the world, the silver lining is multidisciplinary, global and grassroots. Absolutely, that's the right, yep, yep. I would, I wish there was another G. We got grassroots and global in there. Um, ginormous multidisciplinary. <laughs> but yes, I agree. That's what's happening. And what that is, is a great leveling, right? We're turning from having to have the biggest, too big to fail financial institutions, uh, manufacturing institutions to spreading it out um, where we have a lot more flexibility, nimbleness and innovation. Professor, on this note, I want to thank you again for joining Corey and myself. It was a wonderful discussion and I hope we can do that again. And if you don't mind, probably in about a quarter of uh, three months or so, we'll come and see uh, what uh, the landscape looks like. Let's do that. I look forward to it. I've really enjoyed this uh, discussion and I uh, wish you all well as you continue this mission of this startup grind. I hope you have a great academic uh, term and the students and you stay healthy and positive and successful. Thank you. Thank you for your blessings and you too. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Professor. Bye.